Happy Sunday, and thank you again for being part of our online worship service today. It's hard to believe that we're already into May, isn't it? Wow. I hope you're staying well and safe and still being careful about your physical distancing rules and disinfecting your surroundings and yourself, finding ways to occupy your time, getting outside when you can, and staying in touch with each other because that's what a family does. I would remind you that there are a number of ways for you to keep giving your offering to the church in order to cover our ongoing expenses. Easiest way is through PAR, pre-authorized remittance, or simply mailing a check to the church or giving through the site Canada Helps and donating to Thamesview United Church there. If you have any questions, you can email the church or our treasurer Phil Dow or our chair of finance Ellen Shute. This information is on our website as well, www.temsvuc.quadro.net. And happy Mother's Day as well. You know, the history of Mother's Day is centuries old, and the earliest Mother's Day celebrations can be traced back to, well, the spring celebrations of ancient Greece in honor of Rhea, the mother of the gods. Mother's Day is a celebration honoring the mother of the family, as well as motherhood and maternal bonds, and the influence of mothers in our society. During the 1600s, the early Christians in England celebrated a day to honor Mary, the mother of Christ. You know, more flowers and cards are sent and more phone calls made on this day than any other day in the year. It's quite simply a day when we remember our moms. Some with gratitude, some with sorrow, some with regret, some with joy, but with respect, because the Bible tells us that we should honor our mothers. This is my mom. When she was a young woman, and later on, isn't she a cutie? <laughs> She's somebody I'm so grateful to and for, and who I miss very much. And I'm thankful though that our t separation is temporary because I believe I'm gonna be able to spend eternity with her. So if your mother like mine has passed on, remember her today. And if she's alive, call your mom. Here's Mary McIntosh with this week's scripture reading. The reading this morning is from 1 Kings 18, 17 to 39. When King Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troublemaker of Israel? And Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, because you have forsaken the commandments of God and followed the idol Baal. Now, therefore, for all Israel assemble at Mount Car Carmel and with 450 prophets at Baal who eat at Queen Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah then came and said, how long will you go limping along with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if you want to worship Baal, then follow him. Then Elijah said to the people, I am lo alone and left as a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets number 450. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them have one bull cut for themselves, cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire on it. I will do the same. Then you call in the name of your God, and I will call in the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire is indeed God. So the prophets of Baal took the bull that was given them, prepared it, and called on the name of Baal that from the morning until noon, crying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and there was no answer. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry louder, surely he is a god. Either he is meditating, or he's wandered away, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. As midday passed, they raved on, but there was no voice, 
no answer and no response. Then Elijah said to all the people, come closer to me. And all the people came closer to him. Elijah took 12 stones and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar. Next, he put wood in order, cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. He said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. Again, he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time so that the water ran all around the altar and filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering, Elijah said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, that I've done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, so that the people may know that you are God. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and even licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord indeed is God. The Lord indeed is God. Continuing on in 1 Kings 19, 1-6. King Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, so may the gods kill me if, it, if I do not take your life by tomorrow this time. Elijah was afraid, so he got up and fled for his life. He went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. And in his fear and despair, he prayed that he could die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel woke him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there was bread baked on the hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down to rest again, and he was strengthened by the hand of God. May God add his blessings to this reading of his holy word. Thanks, Mary. For over six weeks now, we have collectively been in our new normal of physical distancing. And I'm noticing that the initial fortitude and we can do this attitude is fading. The novelty of home cooked meals and Instagram posts showing our newly acquired culinary skills has slowed to a trickle. The reality is that our current state is wearing on us and we're tired. So I find some encouragement in the raw accounts of human frailty in the scriptures. Now tell me, are you tired of doing the right thing following these rules? Are you tired of walking in faith when there doesn't seem to be any good news? Well, you're in good company. In the book of James, we're told that the prophet Elijah was like us in that he experienced the whole gamut of human emotions. I think Elijah is one of the most interesting characters in the Bible. His life certainly was colorful. God used him at a really important time in Israel's history to oppose a wicked king and to bring revival to the people. Like many other characters in the Bible, Elijah's life was not without its challenges. His life at times was filled with turmoil. There were times where he was decisive and valiant but there were also times where he was fearful and uncertain about what was going to happen. He demonstrated victory and defeat, trailed by recovery. He recognized the power of God, but he also knew depression and loss and anxiety. This great man who fearlessly preached when few would listen, who experienced God's supernatural provision, had a rough patch of extreme discouragement, and oddly, it came on the heels of what looked like the beginning of a revival in Israel. In 1 Kings chapter 18 that Mary just read for us, there's an account of an 
epic showdown between Elijah and the prophets of the gods of Baal. Now, Elijah is determined to show Israel that Jehovah is the one true God, and he succeeds. The contest between Jehovah and Baal centers around the sacrifice of a bull. The true God would be the one to rain down fire on the sacrifice. Even when Elijah dumped gallons of water around the sacrifice, God sent the fire that consumed the whole thing, terrified everyone, including the Baal worshippers. Then, as Israel recognizes Jehovah as the true God, the drought that had plagued them for three years comes to an end and the windows of heaven open and the rain finally falls. Sounds great. Just what Elijah was hoping for. But here's where things take a downward turn. Elijah assumes the battle is over and everybody would return to worship God as they had years ago. It looked like a renewal of faith should have broken out. But instead, there's a bitter disappointment for Elijah. His life is now in danger and King Ahab and Queen Jezebel vow to have him killed. And it's at this point that Elijah suddenly and completely runs out of steam. We're told that this man who bravely stood for God when the majority didn't was afraid. And instead of facing Jezebel like he had done before, he runs away. He quits. At times, I think it's easy for us to hold a perception that people like David and Moses and St. Peter, well, they loom larger than life. But the truth is they all struggled with their emotions. Elijah wrestled as well. The man who stood in solid obedience and courage ran away. He was afraid. You see, there was a lethal combination at work here. First, Elijah was just plain worn out. The human body can sustain an adrenaline high for only so long before it crashes. And secondly, Elijah just couldn't figure out what God was doing. I mean, shouldn't the fire from heaven burning up the sacrifice have turned every heart in Israel back to God? Shouldn't the rain finally coming be enough for Elijah to at last have the ear of Israel? In Elijah's mind, God had let things take a terrible turn. His reward for years of faithfulness was a death threat. Sometimes we wonder if God has taken a turn, let this going on as long as it happens. In this state of extreme dejection, Elijah walks for a full day to a place where nobody can bother him into the wilderness. Exhausted, he rests against a tree and says, I've had enough. He's done. No more fiery sermons, no more faith-filled proclamations, no more miracles, just done. Throughout 1 Kings chapter 19, we can see Elijah grappling with this battle with fear. But we also see God. As Elijah then turns his focus to the Lord, the scene changes. The fear clawing at him dissolves. And yes, Elijah ran away because he was afraid. He didn't know what was happening. But he also found courage through God. In fact, when I read 1 Kings 19's account of Elijah fleeing from the clutches of evil Jezebel, I actually breathe a sigh of relief. And my sigh rises from yet another realization that Elijah was a real person facing authentic human emotions, just like mine. I actually find some comfort in the words that the scripture passage has because they echo my own moments of discouragement. The comfort is that God doesn't seem the least put out by Elijah's discouragement and he didn't leave him. If you read the scripture, you'll notice that God doesn't immediately respond. 
Instead, he lets Elijah rest. And when Elijah had rested, well, God began the process of strengthening him. Elijah was no longer just left by himself. He was given what he needed. He was no stranger to miraculous provisions. Remember, this is the guy who had food delivery via ravens rather than Uber. And he told a woman that her flour and oil would never run out, even during the drought and the famine. But this time, something different happened. An angel of the Lord bakes fresh bread and brings a jug of cool water. A simple meal, but one that is significant. What is it about bread that's so comforting and basic, even with our fear of gluten and carbs? Before bread became a forbidden food to many North Americans, it was considered a staple. If you had bread, you could survive. Beyond that, whatever recipe God used here in this scripture for that bread, it provided complete nourishment for a worn out prophet. Elijah didn't need a fancy meal. He needed bread and he needed water. It seems to me when I am discouraged, my greatest need is a basic one. I need the bread of life and God's living water. Very simply put, I need the presence of Jesus Christ and I need God's word to speak to my life, to my discouraged, anxious soul. Now there's more to this story and I plan to continue it in another sermon, but for now, I want us to be encouraged with this count, account of discouragement. It's part of being human, although God never intended it to be a permanent state, I'm sure. There's a remedy for this malady. Certainly our physical bodies need rest and nutrition, but even more, our souls need the bread of life and living water. So, get out your devotional books and get into reading the Bible. Read through the Psalms and find encouragement about fellow travelers. Read the Gospels and be amazed once again at the love and power of Jesus Christ. Read Romans and be awestruck at God's plan of redemption. Romans ten seventeen says, faith comes by hearing and hearing comes from the Word of God. So let's start reading. Let's start feeding our souls. You know, many times Elijah found himself in the midst of a seemingly dimming situation. It seemed to be getting worse instead of better. But he held on to the promises of God. Isaiah 66 13 says, As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. And that promise of God's presence, God's comfort, strength, and provision is still true for us today. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. The piece we've chosen to do for you today is called The Care the Eagle Gives Her Young. And it's about how God's love for us is as an eagle for her eaglets. And just as the eagle mother sends out her eaglets to learn how to fly, to spread their wings and fly, um, so God tells us to, to fly as well. And then God, like the eagle, like the mother eagle, is there to catch us when we fall. So sing along with us. Enjoy the pictures.
and let's pray together. Jesus, as a mother, you gather your people to you. You're gentle with us like a mother with her children. In your love and tenderness, remake us. You mourn over us with our sin and our pride and tenderly you draw us from hatred to judgment. You comfort us in our sorrow and you bind up those things that wound us. In sickness you nurse us and with your power you feed and strengthen us. Lord, in your dying we are born to new life. By your anguish we can live in joy. In the care of our mothers and fathers and families, we see your care. In your love and tenderness, we make us. When we don't understand what's going on around us, remind us to turn to you, to read about examples of struggles and faith in your word, to spend some time learning from books written for our edification to make sacred moments of prayer a high priority in our days. We, may we remember that we live on what you give us, bread of life, the living water of your spirit. And if we do that, despair turns to hope through your goodness. Through your gentleness, we find comfort in our fear. Your warmth gives life to our dead spirits. Your touch makes us righteous. In compassion, bring us grace and forgiveness. In your love and tenderness, remake us so that we become more and more like you, assured of your unconditional acceptance to be witnesses to the world of your eternal love for we ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. So now go into your week, knowing that you are embraced by the love of God, a love that is sweeter and more tender than any you have ever known. God bless you all. Hi again. This is another hymn that we sing regularly in church, Be Still My Soul. I encourage you to do what it says to do in the, in the hymn. To be still, be patient and trust in God, and in the end, after the storm, there will be a peaceful end. This is an arrangement by Greg Howlett. It's a beautiful arrangement. I hope I do it justice.